Okay, welcome everyone to our next lecture on probabilistic reasoning and machine learning. So today we talk about matrix differential calculus. It's one of my favorite topics. Does it have something to do with machine learning? Isn't this pure math? So why do we have to get tortured by this mathematics stuff? Because it's super essential to calculate derivatives. Yeah? In particular, it's super essential to calculate high, di high dimensional derivatives. That's the basis of machine learning. So the basis of machine learning for neural networks, for example, is backpropagation, where you automatically calculate the derivatives. However, someone has to implement the, all these derivatives. Otherwise, you cannot use the automatic differentiation. So since this lecture should teach you all the basics so that you can invent your new methods yourself, you must be able to calculate derivatives. And you might be able to calculate derivatives already for scalar functions, right? So that's something simple. Or maybe also for vector-valued functions using partial derivatives. However, in this lecture, we will introduce a notation such that you can take the derivative of a function which has a vector-valued input, and you can derive the derivative with respect to the vector without going to the indices and without calculating partial derivatives. There are also some cases where it's basically in my opinion, impossible to calculate derivatives with this partial notation. For example, if you want to calculate the derivative of an eigenvalue, or something like that, or of an algorithm or something. So that's really difficult, but with matrix differential calculus you can. And um, even if you're scared of math, so you have to have a different attitude towards math, I think mathematics is just a different programming language that you need to learn, right? However, one without a compiler. So it only works on pencil and paper, and other people are the compilers and they check what you write. But in principle, it's just a different notation and a different way of writing up your thoughts. So if you learned about object-oriented programming and maybe even Haskell or functional programming, then mathematics is not so much more difficult, right? Actually, it really maps also on some of these concepts. However, so what is the motivation to learn it now, right? Why not learn it when we're talking about neural networks? The motivation is linear regression that we did last, last time, okay? So last time we looked at this model where we um, basically we wanted to model some output y as some linear combination of inputs x, yeah? And again, where I stress now this capital X is a big data matrix where for the purpose of linear regression, the data points, the locations are row vectors, okay? And then you can nicely multiply this with a vector w to generate some linear combination of these inputs, okay? Another possibility is that we first pre-process our x and we push it through some nonlinearity y, uh, uh, phi. I also showed you this nonlinearity phi, which was calculating these monomials. But there are many more, yeah? In a neural network, for example, you are calculating many more. And those are also basically nonlinearities. But then the mass stays the same. The key here is that the whole thing is linear and the parameters W. That's why it's called linear regression. And now if we want to, do, want to be Bayesian, we could also assume a prior on our parameter, okay? And curiously, by having this model assumption, we can derive most of the linear regression stuff that you find on Wikipedia. Yeah? You find scalar linear regression or multivariate linear regression or even some generalized forms. They all fall under this notation here. Um, so one was called ordinary least squares. We didn't call it OLS. Thank you, Sebastian, for your laptop. I hope you have another one. Okay, he has another one. Okay. This is his old laptop here, but it's good enough to do recording and all of this. So ordinary least squares, we didn't call it, but this is what it's typically called when you Google for it or when you talk to statisticians. Um, and in ordinary least squares, what we are doing, we ignore the prior and we just maximize the likelihood. So we have a maximum likelihood point estimate for the parameter w. And we get this kind of yeah, intimidating looking formula, but actually when you look at original works or when you look at other papers, you can write them down much more in a much more nasty way and everything looks even more unclear. So this is already quite clean. And um, if you think about it, what we are doing here, we can also try to understand this formula. So let's try to do this on the board, okay? So how do I switch now, like this, okay? So let's try to do this on the board and, oh, okay, where's my chalk? Okay, here's my chalk. Okay, so the formula is like this. W is equal to 
first of all, we have to turn in the bag, okay? So this term, what is it doing? Um, we have the axis um, in here, so we have the, the vector of y, so the, let's write out the x, so the x are the um, x transpose, blah, 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 to x n transpose, so that is my x. So that means if I transpose the whole thing, I transpose the whole thing, and everything turns around, so what do I get? I get now column vectors, okay? Fine, so I'm multiplying these column vectors now, so let's put it in here too, with my y, okay? And this is like saying, let's take the first coordinate of all data points and let's calculate the inner product with all the entries that I want, okay? This is like calculating a correlation between the first coordinate of my data points and the output that I want. So let's assume mean zero and everything is nice at the center. It's for intuition good. Intuition good. And then there's the second one, and the second one gets also correlated. So basically what we are calculating is part of the correlation matrix. So we, we are correlating each coordinate with the output, okay? And those are the weights. Those are the weights, almost. There's some term missing here. But in principle, that's the idea, right? Suppose the first coordinate is positively correlated with the output. Let's say the correlation is 1, okay? Then the weight will be 1. So take the first coordinate, multiply it with the weight of 1, and you get the output y. Okay, it's so simple. However, there could be a different direction here. Let's say the last one, and it's also very correlated with that one. But now the question is, is this first row and the last row, are they correlated with each other? Because if they are both correlated with each other, then they're saying the same stuff, right? So let's say the first row and the last row are identical. Okay, in both cases, they will be very correlated with the y, but both get the weight 1, yeah? And then I'm kind of overcounting, right? So I need to normalize with the correlations inside of this matrix. And that is what exactly the inverse of this matrix is doing. Again, let's look at this matrix, how it looks like. It's x1, blah, 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 to xn, okay? So that is the x transpose matrix. And that is the usual one. So it's x1 transpose and so on, xn transpose. And so what we are doing here basically is the top left element will be the first row multiplied with the first column of this matrix, which is basically correlating the first coordinate with itself. So it's calculating the variance of the first one, okay? And then we are calculating the first row with the second column over here, which is the second coordinate in my data matrix. So it's calculating the correlation between the first row and the second row, basically. So what does it mean? So it could be that, let's say, the first one and the last one are very correlated. So that means the entry on the top right here could be quite large. And now we are kind of taking the inverse of a matrix. It's not so intuitive, but like, let's keep it simple. So let's say they're very correlated, and now we're taking the inverse. So this is normalizing this overcounting that would appear if I would have two roads which are very correlated with y, they would tell me the same thing, so I would estimate twice the y. And so by multiplying with some inverse correlation matrix, I'm kind of renormalizing the whole thing. Okay? That's why there's this more complicated thing. Another way to see this, this is like an orthonormalization procedure written in matrix form. Okay? So this is just the, is it called Gram-Schmidt orthonormalization? something in linear algebra, I forgot. But if you have a matrix, let's say A, and it contains some column vectors, yeah, um, that uh, are not orthogonal to each other, then there's an orthonormalization procedure by multiplying it with this guy. And now the transpose is a little bit flipped because the A has no transpose. And then this is changing the columns of A in such a way that I get an orthogonal basis. Okay, so this is an orthonormalization. 
and the same in the uh, in in this this thing. So here we're calculating the correlations between the coordinates of x with all the outputs. Here we are calculating the correlations of all the different coordinates with each other, and inverting that one. So if here's a large correlation, we want to lower the influence of those. Okay, and that's just what the formula is doing. Okay, so that's why the formula is looking like it's looking. Okay, so it totally makes sense. However, how can we derive it now from the least square formula? We, how can we derive it in? in just by ideally never touching indices. Okay, so that's the goal. And I think you will do it in the exercises. After this lecture, you can do it. Okay? Next thing, ridge regression. Again, ridge regression is a notion, I don't know who who's calls it ridge regression, whether machine learning people or the statisticians, but um, it's a regularized regression. So sometimes um, this matrix here is not so invertible. So sometimes the matrix is low rank, or mathematically speaking, there might be some small eigenvalues in there, okay? And having small eigenvalues, if you invert a matrix, yeah, these eigenvalues, you, you um, invert them too. You have one divided by the eigenvalues, so the matrix can explode. And we typically call this, how oh, this is numerically not stable, yeah? Meaning, there are eigenvalues which are maybe 10 to the minus 14. And when you invert the matrix, you get eigenvalues 10 to the 14, which is very unfortunate for computational reasons, reasons typically, okay? So we regularize, and how do you regularize? You add something to the diagonal. And we are not so, in PCA we will talk more about these eigenvalues and this kind of stuff, but suppose um, you calculate the eigenvalues of this guy and you sort them by size, then they might look something like this. Yeah, so now what did I plot? So for each, so this is the largest eigenvalue, this is the second largest, the third largest, and so on. And this is the so-called eigenvalue spectrum, okay? It's going down. And generate a random matrix and look at it. It's quite interesting. So how did I plot it? I just calling Ike, or maybe Ike H. I forgot which one, maybe with or without. And then you get the eigenvalues in NumPy. It, maybe it's NPN lin alg or something. I forgot. You can figure this one out where, where to find it. And this will give you the eigenvectors and the eigenvalues. And if you plot them sorted, you get a curve like this. And so if some of them are really, really small, it's not very nice. However, if you add now some numbers to the diagonal, this is like lifting up the eigenvalues. Okay? So basically, before the zero was here, and now the zero will be down here, and this will be 1, okay, since the eigenvalues of the identity is 1, okay? So you are lifting the whole thing, and suddenly the, you can invert it, and the inversion is good. You're putting a little bit of a mistake on the thing you actually want to do, but instead of doing something numerically very stable, which will make you very unhappy when you look at the numbers, you add something to it, and you can also add a lambda, and then this will, will shift it by lambda, okay? And this is well justified by numerical reasons. However, it can also be well justified by assuming uh, some Bayesian model down here and then deriving basically this formula as the maximizer of the posterior, so as the map estimate. Okay. Um, let me change this thing here. Why is not the, this window not showing up anymore? Yeah, whatever. We can't fix it now. Hopefully the recording works fine. Okay. Uh, or maybe I can do it like that. I move this screen over, and then maybe I can see that everything works fine. Yeah, okay. So this is good. This is okay. So we can derive the ridge regression, which is a robustified linear regression formula. We can derive it by assuming a, a prior. And as it turns out, the lambda is the ratio between the sigma squared and the tau squared, which also is a nice interpretation, because the sigma squared is the measurement noise, yeah, and the tau squared, okay, that is my preconception, so that is yet another, it's a little bit like signal-to-noise ratio, but let's say it a little bit hand-wavy, so it's not exactly signal-to-noise ratio. Okay, and also this formula can be derived nicely with the matrix differential calculus. And um, finally, we also looked at Bayesian linear regression, which says, 
Now, why do a point estimate at all? So maybe we want to do prediction, okay? And if we want to do prediction, we might want to not estimate really a, a W, a particular one, a point estimate, but we want to estimate the future, okay? And we don't care for the parameters of our model. So that's something fancy too. Anyway, so to derive these kind of formulas now, we need this matrix differential calculus. So today we learn how to calculate derivatives of, this looks large, scalar vector matrix valued functions. So the valued says the output is a scalar, a vector, a matrix of scalar vector matrix valued variables and all combinations. Yeah? And so the, if you write it like this, so a valued function, then you say something about the output of blah, 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 valued variables. That's something about the input. Great. So I got my knowledge about this matrix differential calculus from this book, Magnus and Neudecker, and the PDF was available somewhere online. I don't know whether they um, removed it because they republished it, but if you Google for matrix differential calculus, Magnus Neudecker, then ideally you will find a PDF of the book. Um, the, the PDF is written for, I think, econometric students, or um, yeah, I think not for mathematicians and not for um, computer scientists. However, it's very well written and it's very mathematical, so it's quite tough at times. But if you want to get to some drill deeper or you want to have some, some weird derivative of an, I said, eigenvalues, but you can also calculate derivatives of eigenvectors or of even more fancy stuff in linear algebra, of the determinant, okay, if you really want to be fancy. In this book, you will find the answer, okay? It's all in there. <coughs> um, there is a paper, yeah? So it's, I don't know, MDC chapter 18. I'm not sure what we get if I click on it. Um, but uh, the, the same content of the book is also in some papers from Magnus and Neudecker. I have a short version, which I made myself, and that is basically like distilling the stuff from the books that you need in practice, okay? So basically, the... The, it's like an instruction manual that you can put on your site, and when you do a derivative, you just need this PDF file. Another fun book is the Handbook of Matrices. So it's a, it's a book just on matrices, on properties of matrices, on rules, on transformations, on uh, whatever, Kronecker product, Hadamard product, and all the different things that you can do. So that's another source that you sometimes need if you do this seriously, okay? Anyway, so let's get started now with Matrix differential calculus. First of all, you might know the word matrix already. Of course you know. It's just an array, right? A 2D array. Um, there's a calculus. You might know what a calculus is. A calculus is like a machine. Or in mathematics, a calculus is like a set of rules that you can apply mechanically to your formulas. Yeah. So for example, you learned already a differential, uh, not a differential calculus, but a derivative calculus when you learn formulas like, um, so suppose you, you, at some point in your career, I'm sure you learned a formula uh, that if f of x is equal to g of x um, times h of x, then you learned a formula for the derivative of f of x, right? Did you learn this? Yes. So this is the calculus now that you can go from here to here, which says that it's g prime of x hx plus g of x times h prime of x. Okay, in other countries, often they use the partial notation or they use this d by dx notation. Okay, so this is the calculus that I can go from this expression. So what is this expression? It's an equality with terms here and here. And if that one is true, the next one is also true. Okay, um, and now there's the third word, differential. And now what is the differential? So the differential, I won't define perfectly mathematically. We, do, we use it like a bit hand wavy and more intuitively. So the only thing I say about it is a differential is an infinitesimal change in some varying quantity. That's my definition. Okay? An infinitesimal change means it's smaller than everything. Okay, so it's smaller than every real number, which is weird if you don't know non-standard analysis, if you know standard analysis, those are these additional things that you need for non-standard analysis. Okay, I said this word enough. If you don't know this, you can just think of it as some new objects. 
which have the property to be larger than zero but smaller than anything else. Okay? And it's kind of weird, right? So it's not really something like a real number. It's more something that is defined by its properties. So I, I cannot imagine something smaller than any real number. But I could think of a mathematical object which I define to be smaller than all real numbers but larger than zero. Okay? It's just something else. It's not a number. Yeah? But we think of it as some very small interval. The notation is as follows. So for a variable x, I can have a differential. And it's notated as dx. Okay, and this dx is not, it's not um, random. This is exactly the dx that we also write in integrations or into the Leibniz notation for derivatives. This is exactly the same dx. It's a very small piece on the same axis as the x. In particular, it has the same unit as x. And if the x is a vector, let's say a five-dimensional five vector, then dx is also a five-dimensional vector. Okay. Next, suppose now we have a mapping. Yeah, we are computer scientists. We map our variables onto other stuff. We do computations. So suppose now we do a computation on our x and get a y. Yeah, then we, the differential of y is exactly equal to the differential of x times the derivative of my function x. Okay, so that is already the defining equation for differentials, I think. So this one could see it like that. So now let's see whether this notation makes sense. Suppose we use this Leibniz notation for derivatives and we write dy divided by dx for our derivative. Then this totally makes sense to define it like that, right? So this is equal. Yeah? It kind of makes sense. The x cancelled out. Similarly, um, the dx also appears in integration. And the integration is just, if you think of a Riemann integration, you um, make lots of uh, little intervals and you calculate the height of the function in each of the intervals and then you take the summation of all the small pieces. So if we have infinitesimal, that's the, difficult, the difficulty here, the, the right wording, the infinitesimal small numbers, yeah, then basically we could say, okay, the integration is the same as that one, right? Because we are here somehow summing over infinitely many x's. Okay? And again, this is a bit hand wavy, but for intuition. So the dx is exactly the dx that you typically write in integrals. Okay, and now basically this is the definition of it. Okay? So this dy, if y is the image of x, then dy is defined to be the dx times the derivative. Um, out of this definition, one can derive all the rules of the calculus. However, we won't derive the rules. We just look at them, okay? And we just use them. Um, another way to view it, by the way, is the dx is so small that in principle my y could be linearly approximated, okay? As you know, the, let's say f is a continuous function or a differentiable function. Probably I need it that it's differentiable, right? Otherwise, it doesn't make sense to say f prime. But I'm, I'm omitting all these assumptions. We only have nice functions here. So basically, it says it's so small that I can approximate a little change in y just by the linear mapping that I get if I plug in the, the derivative. So it's like saying the dx is so small that the, that the Taylor approximation with the linear term is perfect. So that's another way to say that it's very small. Okay. Anyway, so now what can we do with it? Um, we want to, actually, we are interested in derivatives and not differentials, right? So um, let's introduce another notation for the derivative here. For the f prime, let's write df of x. Why are we doing this? Because um, the prime is, I think it's not very useful if the x becomes a vector or a matrix and everything gets a bit more messy. So we want to have a, a more general notation. And that's what they're doing here. In particular, note that the bracketing is as follows. So or maybe since it's as follows, I put it on the board. So the df of x is the bracket. If you put brackets, you should put them like that. OK? So the d is an operator that operates on a function. Again, you know functional programming, right? So no problem. This is a function that takes another function and spits out a function. and then we give it an x. Okay, so that's the ordering here. But it is just another notation for the 
f prime of x. Okay, so nothing really happens here. It's not dangerous. Um, now then we have basically the identification formula, and that's the formula that we've seen already. It before we wrote it as dy is equal to the derivative of f times dx. So now why is this the identification formula? It basically means if we can derive for our function f that we want to calculate the derivative for, yeah, if we can change the expression for df in such a way that the dx is on the very far right, then the expression before it is a derivative. So then we can read off the derivative. And I will do several examples on the board in a second. Okay. So now here's the recipe. Okay. So this is your cooking recipe: how to get the derivative with differential calculus. You first have an expression where you want to calculate the derivative of, and you put the letter d in front of it. That's the first step. That's a simple one. Then you need to be sure what are the constants here and what are the variables that I'm interested in. Okay. So you have to make clear. Which terms can vary and which terms do not vary? Okay. Then you do the transformation using our calculus. The rules will follow shortly. And once we transformed it and massaged it in such a way that there's a dx on the far right. Far right is over here, I think, for the video. Then you're done, and you can read off the derivative. Okay. So that's it. Um, now again, you you know I like notation a lot. And I think notation simplifies our life. Yeah. So in this lecture, and I think in many other lectures, I'm using the following conventions. For scalars, I'm using small Greek letters. For vectors, I'm using small Latin letters. Okay. However, sometimes the vectors are from the R to the one, so they are scalars. But in this lecture, they are really vectors. And matrices, I write with capital Roman letters. Yeah, or Latin letters. Okay, so here comes the first rules. So suppose we are only talking about scalars now, right? Why? Because we know already how to do it for scalars. There is some existing knowledge. Let's look at the rules. The differential of a constant function alpha is just zero, right? Which makes sense because a constant function, the derivative is zero. So if it's constant, yeah, every identification table. Should give me a zero. So let's apply this formula just fun, for fun. So let's say uh, I'm defining a function alpha of beta, a scalar of a scalar, okay? And let's say it's constant to 17, right? Now we know already. We know that alpha, whoops, alpha prime of beta that is equal to zero, right? Or if we now use the new notation. We could also say the derivative of alpha is equal to zero. We could be more specific and write a beta down here. Yeah, now you see. So this beta here is the input to my function, but this is telling me with respect to what variable am I calculating the derivative. However, I'm often omitting that one because it's like clear from the context. So if we now apply our calculus, it means we put a d in front of it. So we say d alpha. And I'm omitting the of beta, right? So I can keep it in my head that alpha is a function of beta. Then I plug in the expression for the alpha. The expression is 17, so it's d17, and 17 is definitely constant, so it's equal to zero. How can I now read off my derivative? I can multiply it with d beta. Okay, and then I can read off the derivative. Over here, of course, this is a simple case possible. What else can you do? So the alpha is a constant. If I have the, the differential of a constant times a function, yeah, it is the same as alpha times d phi. So now this is the first interesting rule. So it tells us how to transform d alpha phi into something else. Okay. Um, there's also one for summation. And if you have a sum of two scalars, which might be functions of some parameters, it's not specified. It's just a differential of each of them. Yeah. So this differential is a linear operator. Yeah. So if you put a linear function in, you can drag out the linearity, kind of. Yeah. You can drag out a scalar. You can kind of split it into some sums, uh, summons. What about the next one? 
It's a differential of a product of two functions, and we get exactly the formula that we know already. However, be careful, those are differentials, but they follow the same rule that you already know. So, how about the next one, the quotient? So, for a quotient, luckily it's again still the same formula that you already know from kindergarten, elementary school, let's say high school. I think it's called Kuven Diskussion, right? And Kuven Diskussion sounds so boring, doesn't it? I mean, they should call it deep learning or something, right? Calculating derivative is machine learning. That's exactly what you do. Okay, so those are the rules. Here's an example. Let's go through it. Let's do it. So, just a squared function. Right? Why using these boring examples? Because, I mean, those are the ones that you can do in your head. Those are the simple, simple ones, right? So let me um, clean the board. And the key is always to do it very mechanical. And if you peek at the slides at home already, you will see that there, there will be more difficult ones too. So where do I put it? Maybe down here. Okay, let's copy it. So, um, this is on the, I hope this is on the video, if I'm far. So, yes, it is on the video, very nice, no laptop in between. So, phi of psi, psi squared. Again, I could also just say phi, right? So, we have it in, so phi is a quantity, another variable, which depends on other variables. That's no problem. So let's use it mechanically. We put the d in front of our expression, d phi. Let's plug in the expression. Uh, we can also rewrite it as d xi times xi. Let's put brackets. Let's be really careful here. OK. So it's a differential of this product. And for that one, we have a formula, one that you know already. And so that is differential of the first one times the second one. And again, let's put brackets, yeah? Plus psi times d psi. Let's don't put brackets here. Yeah, we could, yeah, sure. After a while, you get some good conventions, when to put brackets and when not. If in doubt, put brackets, okay? Maybe a computer could pass something else also, but maybe you can't pass it with the additional brackets because of operator precedence, right? You don't know which is, is this one binding stronger or is the time start binding stronger? So that's unclear. So far, so good. Now, how can I get the d psi out of this? Okay, I can already, let's say the brackets are gone. So it's, in this expression, everything is nice. So what about this one? How do I get it to the end? What can we do? We use the Commutativgesetz, right? So let's, this is just scalars. As I said, d xi has the same type or the same shape as the xi. And the xi is a scalar, so d xi is also a scalar. So I can just flip them, right? So I get xi times d xi, and I have it again over here. Fine. Oh, now I have the right form, and I can read off the derivative over here. Yeah? And luckily, it is the right one. So now I would write it as d phi is equal to 2 psi. OK? So far, so good. I'm overdoing a little bit these in-between steps, but once we get to vectors, it's, there's more thinking required. OK? OK, next one. Oh, this is the solution. Great. OK, so we did a good job. So it's also on the slide. You don't have to copy it. Let's get more rules. Here are more rules. Let's now we have vectors, okay? So the A is a vector, yeah? So again, if my A is a constant, yeah? A constant vector, it's not varying with the variables that I'm interested in, yeah? Then the differential will be zero. 
However, now we are a bit more careful. So the zero sub n is a vector of size n with all filled with zeros, where the n is now the size of my vector a. Okay, so the shape of the differential of a is the same as the shape of a. So this is a column vector of length n if a is a column vector of length n. Okay, so far so good. That was the first hurdle. What about a scalar, alpha, which is also constant? I can just drag out of the differential, same thing. Uh, the summation is again a summation. Now comes an inner product, okay, fine. So inner product actually just is the same rule as we had before. But we have to be a bit careful with the transposition, yeah? So that's now a little bit added difficulty. What about the differential of a transposed vector? So a transposed vector, yeah? is a row vector, so my, my vectors are all column vectors, so now this vector is a row vector, the d of a row vector must be a row vector. So it's very natural then to take the transpose of the differential. Also transposition is just reshaping, right? And reshaping is just a linear operation, if you think about it. Right? Why is transposition or reshaping a linear op operation? Because you can always take any tensor or matrix or vector or whatever and you make it a long column vector and you multiply it with some weird matrix to get a different shape of something. Does it make sense? No, not really. Okay, but transposition and reshaping is a linear operator and can be just dragged in and out of linear operators. Okay? Example. Let's find the derivative of phi x, x transpose. Okay, so my function phi is equal to x transpose x. And again, it should be seen as a function of x. How do I get the derivative now? The usual way you would do it probably would be, okay, let's, let's be a bit more mathematical about it. It's a function from r to the n to r, right? The inner product is a scalar. So I can calculate the partial derivatives. Fine, let's do that. So, partial derivative. We could write xi, but when I do things on a piece of paper, I would take x1, okay? Because it doesn't matter and it's easier. So, derivative with respect to x1 of my phi of x, let's do it like that. So, how can I apply it now, a 1, to such an expression? There is no x1, so let's write out this so it's xi squared i equals 1 to n. Okay, great. The derivative of constants is 0. So for i not being equal to 1, okay, all the derivatives are 0, right? So this partial thing is also a linear operator that you can drag into summations. And then you have the partial derivative of x2 squared, of x3 squared, they are all 0. So it's only for the first entry interesting. So it's x1, x1 squared, and this is now, those are scalars, so I should give them actually Greek letters, but actually I want, I'm now having these sub-indices, so those are scalars too, and I get 2 times x1 squared. Okay, and now let's say, okay, let's say j, fine, j, and I have the derivative. And now I could be creative and say, ha, ah, but I actually want to avoid these sub-indices. Those are all for loops, right? And for loops in Python are slow. So I want to have a vectorized thing. I want to run NumPy. Question? Why is it 2x squared? Ah, yeah, yeah, it's wrong. So it's like this. Thank you. So you are listening. That was not a test. That was my mistake. OK, great. Yeah, this is the derivative. Very true. Now we want to avoid for loops. We don't want to have indices in NumPy. If we want to have speedy code, you want to use the BLAST library, you want to be fast, never use for loops. So we have to be creative, turning this thing somehow into a derivative. And we could by now having this notation and saying partial with respect to a vector, where it gets already a bit fishy what we exactly mean by that. But in this case, we can write it like that, okay? So we could say, here we have a vector kind of as a solution. It's two times the vector. So we put all these partials. So this is basically the partial with respect to x1 and so on, partial with respect to 
xn, okay, of phi of x. Okay, this is also weird, so let's say it's in here, but you know what I mean, okay? Good, so this is the classical way. Let's do the same thing, but in this style, okay? Let's now do it nicer, and maybe it even fits down here, so let's try to fit it down here. We do it to totally mechanically. We write down the expression, it's phi. We put a d in front of it and plug in the expression for phi. So it's d x transpose x. For that one now, we have a formula. And again, let me put lots of brackets here. So it's d applied to this expression. So we get um, dx transpose. Yeah, this is the first factor. Or how did I write down? Oh, I did already a step outside. Okay, fine. So that's how I, how I wrote down the, the calculus. Plus x transpose dx. So I would have derived the formula as well, but it's already in there, so that it's already the transpose of the um, differential. So it's that one. And now how can I isolate the dx? How can I get it? Kind of, how can I combine this guy with that, that one? Any ideas? I think we did the same trick last time. Yeah, I can drag it out. Okay, let's do that. So you're saying if I drag it out, I get x transpose dx like this, right? Okay, next. It's right, it's correct. Think about what is the, the type of this one? You're a computer scientist, what's the shape? Of an inner, the result of an inner product is a scalar. And there's a nice rule for the transpose sign. Alpha transpose is equal to alpha. Right? You can transpose a scalar and nothing happens. So I can just omit it. Great. Now I have twice the same term. And I get 2 times x transpose dx. Great. And I can read off my... Derivative, so this is the derivative of phi. And there's always a question, is it now the transpose one or not? That's always something you need to double check. Should the derivative of a vector valued function be a row vector? Yes or no? It's unclear. It's also unclear here what's the best notation. Should the gradient be at the same shape as the variable or not? Yes, the gradient should always have the same shape. However, the derivative often doesn't have it. So another notation, by the way, is this nabla thing which you might have seen, right? And there, at least my, not my convention is the nabla is calculating the gradient of it, and the gradient always has the same shape as the input. Right? Why is it nice? Because in gradient descent, you're having this. So this is now just a little excursion. You know gradient descent, maybe. So you are updating some xt plus, as some, some x times the gradient of some loss function, right? So that is like an update rule from optimization that you might know. And then it's nice if this guy has the same shape as that one. Yeah. However, the derivative sometimes is transpose, and that's, I think, our convention here too. But that's always something where you need to be careful. OK, great. So that is the, the first derivation. And I didn't put the details here on the slides. But they are really simple, yeah? And um, so in this derivation, I never use the subindex, which is nice. I directly get the vector valued solutions, and I don't have to be creative of, now how can I com can combine these guys again into a vector or something, OK? So it just works. Next one, let's go on to matrices. So let's say our input is, in, uh, we have now roots for matrices as well. So the first one is the differential of a constant matrix is, of course, the zeros matrix, OK? So this is the matrix, the m times n-shaped matrix of zeros, OK? Where a is also an m times n-shaped matrix. Maybe I should put it down here that a is of m times n shape. I can drag out alphas. I can have the summation rule. And I also have a rule for multiplication. Also, here it doesn't matter which term you use first, because plus is also commutative, okay? 
n transpose signs could be dragged out. And here's a new one, the trace of a matrix. If you have the, di uh, the differential of the trace of a matrix, it commutes with the trace. Again, trace now is really a linear operator because it's summing up the diagonal entries. Okay, So that is really a linear operator, so it makes sense that it commutes with the D. Good. Example. Now, we get a trace of x transpose x. So now why do we get a trace here? Because we want to have, for now, and in most cases, a scalar-valued function. Even though we will, get, we will learn the superpowers today to also have vector-valued functions and matrix-valued functions, in machine learning we typically have scalar-valued functions. The output is typically a scalar of the ones where we want to calculate the derivatives. Example, the loss function in deep learning is always a single number. Right? Minimization of something requires that you have a scalar. So let's do the same thing now for the phi of x with um, matrices. It will be almost the same steps. However, now there's this trace additionally in here. And now here I'm using operator precedence that I defined myself, so the trace is very loosely binding. So you have an expression, right, and then basically it's always like that. So the trace is very loosely binding. So let's mechanically put the D in front of it. Uh, next we have D trace of it. And again, here you have to think so the D is not so strongly binding that it's binding like this or something, so the expression is like that. But I'm omitting it. So first step is dragging in the D and then applying again my rules. And I'm doing exactly the same as down here. Let's do it. So it will be, ah, no, there's some there's an additional trick involved. So let's do it slowly. So it's that one plus... So it's again product rule, and again the traces apply to the whole thing. Yeah. Now, how could I isolate the dx to the very far right? I think I can't drag it out of the trace, but instead I need a new identification formula, which is more general than the one that we have. And let me preview the thing that we are pointing at. So here are the identification tables. So this is a big table of all possibilities. So the first three are scalar-valued output, then vector-valued output, and then matrix-valued output. And then there are these inputs, xi, x, and capital X. And there we have basically formulas for the differential. So we've seen already Z1 over here. How can I mark something? Oh, like this. We've seen Z1 already that we used already. Then we used already this one. That was the one for the inner product where when you look at it actually, we're having a, a vector transpose times the differential, which is also a vector. So some inner product here. And then we say the first vector is our derivative. However, now for the matrix input, we have a different identification table uh, formula. And that is a trace of some matrix valued function transpose times dx. But it's all happening inside the trace. And then we can read off the derivative to be the vectorized version of this matrix. Whew, so this gets more fancy. So what about this VEC operator? The VEC operator takes a matrix and stacks all columns on top of each other. OK, it's just vectorization. Or in NumPy, it's like you're reading out a, a big matrix just as a linear array. OK, it's the same thing. So, why so complicated? Wouldn't it be nice if the derivative would be a matrix, right? So that, that would be useful. Um, there we get now into problems with notation. Here are the problems of notation. Um, let's say we have a function from R to the N to R to the M. Are you doing these kind of functions in MAFI? 17 or in some MAFI thing? Are you looking at multivariate functions that have multivariate input and multivariate output? I think you do. Um, and then you're defining the Jacobian matrix yeah, that has entries partial of f 
Ah, I forgot which ordering. So you're going back to the scalar derivatives and you're saying, I want to have the i's output, so f sub i, and take the derivative with respect to the j's input. And this is giving you a matrix. Okay? So here, at the end, the rows, uh, the rows and the columns, they both refer to input dimensions. Ah, no, they, no, wrong. One is referring to input dimensions, the other one is referring to output dimension in this case. Um, and now the question is, if I have a function g, which is going from matrix world, let's say, into the real numbers, how would I write down the Jacobian for that one? So this notation only works if I'm having r to the n, but not r to the n times m times blah, times blah, times blah. Similarly for the output. So this Jacobian thing is a good idea to say that um, the rows correspond to the outputs and the columns correspond to the inputs. However, if we have a matrix input, then the number of rows should be n times n. Okay? And that's exactly what we are doing here. So let's look at the shape. The shape of the derivative for the case of a matrix input and a scalar output will be 1 times n times q, where n and q is the shape of my input matrix x. Okay? And the 1 is the number of outputs. So this is like using the same conventions for Jacobians, that the ro number of rows is the number of outputs, the number of columns is the number of inputs. But for matrices now, the thing gets more messy. In particular, if we now increase it, like in the extreme case, we have a matrix-valued input, so we have n times q many columns, but we possibly have also matrix-valued output, so we have m times q many rows, okay? And so, if you're fine with this convention that the number of columns is the number of inputs and the number of rows is the number of outputs, then you need to do something about this in here and you vectorize the AX into a long row vector, okay? So that's why, why you have a row vector here, okay? Just because you want to have all inputs along the columns. Okay, let's look at it again. Now it's a trace of a matrix times a matrix. Okay, interesting. What about this one? So that was just a derivative times some scalar number. So it's one number times another number. What is the inner product? So this is the summation of all the entries in one vector times all the entries in the other vector. So wouldn't it be nice to have here two matrices and basically the differential is the sum of all entries in the first matrix times all entries in the second matrix. Okay? So that would be the natural generalization of these two cases over here. And actually, that's what this formula is. But let me show you. Um, let's erase something. There must be a way. Okay, so what we want is uh, some operation such that we are summing up all entries. So that would be like a natural generalization of the first two cases, right? In the very first case, we are multiplying the scalar with the scalar value of the derivative. With the inner products, we are multiplying each entry of the first vector with each entry of the second vector and, and add, some, add everything up. And so this would be the generalization for two matrices. Okay? So let's see what the trace of A times B is. And um, I guess, uh, let's say B transpose. Okay? Or let's put it in, the, in between so then it looks like an inner product. So let's calculate this. Okay? So this is the trace of a matrix with the following entries. So there are the entries. So it's Aij times B. Uh, the A is transpose. So oh, let's first, uh, let's write it like this. Um, 
i k. Oh, now they have the same same size. Okay, let's say k. Um, okay. How can I write it nicely? Okay, first let's do the A transpose. Okay, for that I now use the following notation. It's the matrix A. Oh no, it's the entries. Huh? I should have practiced that one. Okay, I'm no, usually I'm doing row times column, but since this is transpose, I'm doing column times column. Okay? So far, so good. So I'm doing column times column, and I'm summing up over the rows. So it's the i, and then I'm summing up over the, uh, over the column index on both of them. And so by having this summation over here, that corresponds to multiplying with a transpose. And so this is giving me a new matrix with entries j and k. Make sense? So those are scalars, but they are indexed by j and k. They are the free variables. And so this is a new matrix along j and along k. And if I calculate the trace, I'm going over the diagonal. So I'm putting yet another summation where j is equal to k. So I can plug in a j for both of them. So it's a summation of the i, a i j, b i j. I replace the k now with j because the trace is summing up the diagonal. Okay? And so this summation is suddenly exactly the one that we wanted. So the trace of A transpose B is exactly the summation of these. Yeah? What are we doing if we are not convinced? We are looking at code. So let's, let's for fun, let's look at some code. Okay? So this is already imported. I actually wanted to show you something else, but let's do this. So let's take a random matrix A. Um, can I do it like this? Will it work? Five by three? Yes, it works. And let's take another matrix of the same shape. And now we are, want to have um, something which is like the inner product for vectors, but we want to have it for matrices. Right? Inner product for vectors multiplies all entries and sums everything up. And so let's do the same thing by saying we say A times B. Yeah, so that is the, the Hadama pro product. So that's the, sum, that's the product of all entries. Yeah, so far so good. And we sum everything up. Does it work? Yes, it works. Great. So let's do the same thing now, but let's use the trace. Okay. Um, can I do A dot trace? A dot trace, does it exist? No, it's not. So how do I get the trace? Um, is it np dot trace of a? I oh, never use a keyboard you never used. No, okay, maybe it's in linalc. No, does anyone know where the trace is? <laughs> trace? No. Can anyone, can one of you do a quick Google for NumPy trace where it is? I need it desperately. <laughs> What's that? NumPy.trace. Numpy .trace. Okay, I haven't tried that one. Okay, lucky, lucky me. So now I need to transpose it. And now I need to take the proper inner product, but for that I have to find the add sign. Okay, I found it. And we get exactly the same result. Okay? So that's a nice way to prove things too. Take a random matrix and put the formulas. Okay, so far so good. Um, so this horrible looking thing is actually calculating the inner product of two matrices. That's it. It's the first matrix transpose times dx. Where were we? We were at our nice derivation on the board. And we need to isolate the dx under the trace now. How can we do this? Okay, first of all, let's isolate this. We can uh, uh, trace, 
The trace is a linear operator, so I can put it on each of the summons. Okay, and now comes a really nice formula. The formula that says the trace of A transpose is the same as the trace of A, right? That's fine. So let's apply a transpose sign over here. So I get the transpose sign. And transposing this matrix will give me an x transpose and a dx, which happens to be exactly that one. So I could have put a 2 in front of it. And then I can read off my function a of x. And if I then would say, OK, take the vector version and transpose it, I have the derivative. OK, now this is the derivative of this, this guy. OK, so far so good. So this is the derivation of all of this. Um, here are most rules copied. So this is the stuff that I showed you already, but there are some more fun rules. So d of a vec is vec of a d, fine. There's also Kronecker product. I don't know whether you heard of Kronecker product. Uh, I can briefly show you what Kronecker product is. Um, you know there's Hadamard product, and there's matrix product, and then there's Kronecker product. So now you're asking, do we need all this? Yeah, we need it sometimes. You need it sometimes. When you do derivations, you sometimes need it. It's good to know what these extra functions are in PyTorch. OK. Did I just get a message? No, I didn't. OK, so there's the usual matrix, matrix multiplication. That's the one you know. And then there's the Hadamard product. So and what is that one? That is the matrix. Let's again use the notation where I'm using A, where I'm component-wise multiplying two matrices. OK? That's the Hadamard product. And now sub IJ is again making it a matrix. Yeah? I'm not happy with this notation, though, but you know what I mean. So this is just the same as in, um, in Python to write the star operator. Just the same thing. So now comes the Kronecker product. And for the Kronecker product, you need lots of space because you are creating gigantically large matrices. First of all, note, for the normal multiplication, we need the requirement that this might be an M times N matrix, and B must be an N times K matrix. So the inner dimensions must agree. For the Hadamard product, if we have an M times N matrix, we also need an M times N matrix. OK? Now comes the Kronecker product, and the Kronecker product always works for any matrix. And from that information, you might already come up with the formula, right? If you are creative. But I tell you, so the Kronecker product, if this is an M times N matrix and this is a P times Q matrix, then the Kronecker product will be an R to the MN. Uh, now let's not mess it up. R M P times N Q matrix. OK, one which is really large. How does it look like? It's large. So in the top left corner, you will have a matrix which consists of A11 times B. So this matrix is basically matrix B multiplied with the top left element in A. OK? And in the next box, you put a 1, 2 times B in here, and so on and so forth. Yeah, so in the last, basically it's blowing up the whole thing. It's another way of saying, I want to multiply every entry in A with every entry in B and store all results in a big matrix. That's the Kronecker product. And I guess in NumPy, it must be something like um, maybe this one, np.cron or something. The thing is, you never call this function. You never ever want to call this function because it blows up your memory. Okay. However, sometimes you have derivations on a piece of paper where you have the Kronecker product. And you require the Kronecker product. And then you derive further, and you must get rid of it again. Otherwise, you cannot have code which is running fast. Okay? 
So it's an operation which exists mainly on blackboards and pieces of paper, but not in your code. Yeah? In your code, it's typically very bad. Let's look at the roots for it. So the roots are really nice, aren't they? They are just like the usual multiplication rule. Fine, great. For the Hadama, they are also really nice. They are just the usual rules that you know. Uh, here's some fun ones. Determinant. There's also a rule for that one. So the differential of the determinant of u is the determinant of u, so please calculate it, and then the trace of u to the minus 1 times d of u. And so that is really a non-trivial one, which you haven't seen before, I'm sure. This one looks familiar, right? If you have d of e to some scalar, it's e to the scalar times d phi. So that's fine. Here's another one, Determ a differential of log determinant. That's something that happens in log likelihood estimation, right? If you take the logarithm of a Gaussian distribution, yeah, then you have the logarithm of the determinant of your covariance matrix. And so if you want to calculate derivatives with respect to your covariance matrix, you will end up with a d log dead term. It's surprisingly simple. It's just the inverse matrix times du. So why it's not super, super arbitrary, this formula? When you think of it, the derivative of, a, of the logarithm is 1 divided by x, right? And this is similar. It's a general version of it, a matrix version of the same formula. Um, there's also one for the matrix exponential. So that's one physicists sometimes know. There's the matrix exponential. And there's also a formula for that one. Anyway, you don't have to memorize these ones. Not at all, right? So they are things that you have on a um, collection of formulas. We talked already a little bit about that one. Should you be scared about the one down here? No, you really rarely use them in practice. You're mainly minimizing loss functions in deep learning, right? You very rarely do these. But in principle, you could, right? But you rarely do. Here's some more matrix tricks where I might not go into the detail, but those are the matrix tricks that I use when I do derivations. And when I need a new one and I find it in this matrix book from Lutke Pohl, I will put it on the slide. And I did it for like 10, 15 years, and those are the formulas that I used. And there are some fun ones. For example, this one. If you vectorize the product of three matrices, it's the same as doing the Kronecker product between two of them and multiplying it by a vectorized version of the B. That's really interesting, isn't it? Because So it's dragging out the inner matrix. However, when you think about it, A times B times C, it's linear in the entries of B, right? So the entries of B never get squared or multiplied with each other in this expression A times B times C, right? And the vec is just a reshape. So there must be a matrix which is doing the same thing. And the matrix can be written down as something in, in terms of the Kronecker product, which is, in my way, in, in my thinking, very surprising that this is possible. And some other weird stuff with Hadamard products. OK. Now you derived your formula. How do you check it? How do you check your derivative? With code, of course. So here's the code to check derivatives. It's called finite differencing. And where does this formula come from? Ah, let's look at the code. Maybe we identify it. So what we are calculating here is something f of x plus a little delta minus f of x minus a little delta. And then finally we divide by 2 times delta. So this is just the vanilla definition of the um, derivative that you might have learned in school. So f of x is equal to the limit of uh, some delta, which should go to 0. And um, OK, now to be really fitting to the lecture, let's call it f of alpha. Well, alpha was always constant. So let's f phi of xi, right? I hope you are fine with that one. And that is the quotient of phi of psi plus delta minus z1 divided by delta. OK, that's the usual definition of the derivatives that you've seen with f of x. Now I can have a little variation. I could also say, go a little bit to the, to the right, go a little bit to the left, but get closer and closer to the point you are interested in, but then divide by 2 delta. So it's the same thing. It's computationally nicer to do it that way. OK? Now, in computers, we cannot calculate these limits so nicely. 
we just take delta to be really small, which is like 10 to the minus 5. It's really small. Okay? What does it mean, really small? Small means the function I'm looking at should be linearly approximatable. So it should look linear. The delta must be so small that the function looks linear. Okay? Then the formula works. Now, what is the other mumbo jumbo around this? So I need to have some variable for the gradient. It has the same shape as x, of course. The differential has the same shape of x, and we put them to zeros. And then we iterate over all of the entries in my x. So I'm putting a little delta yeah, in my dx at one location, and after my computation, I remove it again. So in this formula, what I'm doing is I'm having a long vector x, and in one of the variables, I'm adding a little delta and subtracting a little delta, and I see how the different, how the function changing is changing if variable 17 is offsetted by delta or minus delta. And then I remove the delta again, and I take the next variable. What about variable 18? Adding a little bit and to both sides. That's why it's called finite differencing. I'm having a finite loop, and I'm looking at little differences. And finally, I have to divide by the size of the interval to get the right coefficient. So far, so good. Here's the finite difference version from MATLAB. There was a time where everyone liked MATLAB. So um, I can show you. Now, before I show you that this code works, I show you more um, derivations. So again, here's the general recipe. Yeah, write the letter D in front, plug in expressions, check what is constant, what is variable, and transform. And possibly you have to use some horrible functions from the previous slides. Yeah, but they are interesting. So here are the pros and cons. The notation is super clean, no indices, mostly. Yeah, mostly no indices, which is good for coding because we like vectors and we don't want to use indices. Um, it's very powerful. You can really calculate. I haven't seen something where you cannot calculate the derivative of. So if, if you can't do it yet, then someone will derive the formula for the differential, and then you can. You just need to include it into your calculus. Sometimes the formulas get, get really complicated, as I show you on the following slides, and it requires some tricks sometimes. More examples. So I show you a couple of more examples here. So what about the derivative of this expression? So it's some least squares expression, OK? It's already quite related to the linear regression example. It's very similar formulas. But the A was the capital X, and the little x is the W. So let's calculate the derivative. Put a D in front of it, and then you apply some calculus, and you will end up with this expression over here. OK, so that thing is then the derivative. And I'm omitting all the steps in between in this case. Yeah? Here's another one. Calculate the derivative of this monster. So this is now the derivative of the formula for the linear regression, but not with respect to the w, but that is already the solution for the w. Let's calculate the sensitivity of this formula with respect to the x. So if I change my data set a little bit, how are the entries in the w changing? OK, that's quite interesting, and we can do it. However, it gets really, really messy. Yeah? But in principle, you can do it. And I'm only using the formulas that I've shown you. We are not going into detail here, but when you apply the d to this product, you first apply it to the first factor, fine, and to the second factor. And then I'm using a shortcut, since you have to write a gazillion times x transpose x to the minus 1. It appears here at many locations. So I give it a name a. And then you apply it to the inver inversion. And there's a formula for applying the differential operator to an inverse of a matrix. Yeah, it's just minus the matrix times the differential of the matrix times the inverse of the matrix. And so on and so forth. And at the end, you will get the derivatives that you wanted. However, often, this is very difficult, but because this is a vector-valued output. And very often, we are not interested in the vector-valued output, but into a scalar-valued loss function. And this derivation gets much easier and the chronic costs are all gone when you apply it with a vector, C. And so when you do these derivations, directly go for the final result. And at the end, you want to have a scalar. Otherwise, things get really messy in between. Okay? 
Again, for your pleasure, I copied it in here, this derivation. Yeah? I'm not going through it now. The formula looks really, really complicated. Um, can we check it? And yes, we can. Of course, how do we do it? With code. So this is the implementation of the finite differencing that we've seen. So this is a check for the um, least square example that I showed you on the slide. Yeah, so this is calculating. These are the formulas that I derived here. Um, which one? Uh, no, this is a different one. This is a one for linear regression, the one I think that you have to do in your homework. But this is the code to check your formula, that the formula is correct. Okay, so I'm calculating the derivative using matrix differential calculus and once with finite differencing. And then this is the one that looks a bit more weird. So this is this big expression here should correspond to the big expression down here. Yeah, it's the same expression. And of course, when I do such a derivation, I always in any case, without exception, do finite differencing, right? Because here are so many possibilities to do mistakes. And as it turns out, also in this case, the formulas are correct and I'm getting exactly the same results. Okay? Okay, what else? Okay, I said never use indices. Sometimes you should, sometimes if you don't, expressions get really messy. So suppose you have like differential of this expression, where now this dike, V, I didn't mention it, but I have the notation of using a capital written dike to be the diagonal matrix that takes a vector as the input. And then there's the, I uh, put it on the board, it's easier than to talk. So there's this notation, and it takes a vector, and it puts the vector along the diagonal. And it has a capital D because it's a matrix, the result. And the input is a vector. And then there's this small diag. And this thing takes a matrix. And this will be a small Latin letter, so it will be a vector. So this thing will be the diagonal of the matrix. So it will be A11 up to A and N. Okay, so this vector. So this is a useful notation. And let's say I'm having this derivative then really to isolate the um, dv to the end, you have to jump through many hoops. Yeah? So it's really quite difficult to do in vectorized notation. It took me a day or so to find these formulas here. So they're really tough. But once you have them, you extended your set of tricks. But if you go to indices, in this case, everything gets simpler. Right? We can also use the differential calculus for scalar value stuff. So it's easier to write it like that. That's just sometimes the notation gets easier. So here's another fancy example, the Rayleigh coefficient, or Raleigh, or I forgot how to pronounce it. Is there someone from Great Britain? Rayleigh, or some English-speaking countries? I, I say, let's say the Rayleigh or the Raleigh coefficient, which is the quotient of x transpose a times x divided by this quotient, this is in a product. What it's calculating, if you, um, maximize this function in x, you will get the eigenvector with the largest eigenvalue. Okay, that's what the Raleigh-Rayleigh coefficient is. And of course, we can calculate derivatives of it as well, right? And if you do, you get this non-trivial expression from it, okay? Um, and we can read off the derivative, basically, of this coefficient, which then, if you iterate, it corresponds to the eigenvalue. Here's another one. Suppose you have an algorithm. So this is the algorithm of steepest descent. Yeah? And now we can calculate also derivatives with respect to x with the initialization. So we could say, I iterate this 10 times, yeah? or k times. What is the sensitivity of my output with respect to the initialization x0? Okay? And that can be computed, too, with the differential calculus. And in this PDF document, bn142.pdf, there's the full derivation of this one in here for you. Um, I'm not saying you should be able to do it. I just want to show you it's super powerful. If you need a derivative that is difficult, use that one. You can also calculate other derivatives, for example, with respect to the matrix A. So this is some steepest descent for, I think, the algorithm for solve. 
And you can calculate the sensitivity with respect to the input matrix A using this one. So it's quite nice. So we are almost on time. Um, let's see whether there's anything in the code. No, this is just um, the code that checks now the examples that I've shown you in the lecture, that they are really working. So in a way, the lecture without this code is kind of lacking. So you can never trust this formula that I derived from a piece of paper. You can only trust them when you try them in code. Um, of course, there's automatic differentiation in PyTorch. And here, just for fun, I tried to use, wrote a little function that also does the same thing. It's calculating the gradients. Now, not with finite differencing, but using the automatic differentiation of PyTorch. And so far, so good. I get the same results, which is quite reassuring. However, sometimes you run them into the limits of PyTorch. For example, for a long time, if you have complex numbers in your mathematics, PyTorch wasn't able to do it. So it couldn't deal with, with complex numbers. But of course, on, with paper and pencil, we can deal with it. And so in some signal processing applications, PyTorch was not able to do it. But matrix differential calculus was. Okay. Anyway, so I hope I advertise this super nice calculus enough for you that you like it. Just as a reminder, machine learning is about learning computer programs. And learning computer programs is typically about finding parameters for a complicated function that has lots of parameters, like a deep neural network. And that is done by gradient descent. So calculating gradients is really super essential for machine learning. That's why we learned it. Anyway, that's it for today. I thanks for your attention, and I see you next, uh, on next Wednesday.